All right, so we're going to look at day three, applications of derivatives, intervals of increase and decrease, and relative, also called local extrema. So the first thing I want to look at is intervals of increase and decrease. So if I call this function over here function f, and I want to look on when it's increasing or decreasing, let's pretend these are dots here at the endpoints, and we'll say, well, from 1 to 3, if I count there, from 1 to 3, the graph is going down, so f is decreasing. And from 3 to 5, the graph is horizontal. And another word for horizontal is that it's a constant function. And then from 5 to 7, the graph is increasing. Okay? So that's pretty easy. Now, what's true about the derivative? Well, the derivative is the slope, and the sign of the slope has to do with increasing or decreasing. So if f is decreasing, f prime would be less than 0, or f prime would be negative. And on this interval, uh, f prime would be 0, because if it's a constant, it has a slope of 0. And then if it's increasing, its slope is positive, so f prime is greater than 0, or positive. Now, what about the endpoints of those intervals? Well, at the very, very end points, I don't really care what the derivative is there, and neither does the AP exam. But at these interior points here, this comes down, stops, and then goes across like that. My derivative there, that looks kind of like a corner to me, I would say at those points, um, at x equals 3 and 5, f prime of x, either equals zero or does not exist. It depends on how sharp you think those corners are there. Um, if this is a quadratic, then it does come down to a slope of zero and go across. The derivative would exist in equals zero. But that looks like a pretty sharp corner. So if I were just doing it based on looks alone, I would say at these points, the derivative doesn't exist. Now, what does that mean for us? It means that really we can look at what the derivative is doing to determine whether something is increasing or decreasing. So if f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b and differentiable on the open interval from a to b, then if f prime is greater than 0 at each point on a, b, f is increasing on the closed interval from a to b. So what that means is when we define intervals of increase and decrease for our class, we are going to close the brackets. Now, I will not take off for open versus closed, neither will the AP, but technically, in calculus, we define, inter define intervals of increase and decrease as being closed. And the best explanation I can give you for that is that basically something needs to start and it needs to stop. And when you define intervals of increase and decrease, you need a starting point and an ending point, therefore we close it. It's not a great explanation, but it's an explanation. But long story short, if f prime is greater than 0, then f increases. If f prime is less than 0, then it decreases, okay? So when we come down here, if I want to figure out when that happens, I want to know when f prime is positive versus negative. Well, if something changes from positive to negative, doesn't it have to pass through 0? Or maybe doesn't it have to maybe not exist for a second and kind of blink, for lack of a better explanation? Well, yeah, it does. So if I want to look for changes in increase versus decrease, I should probably look for when it equals 0 or does not exist, and then test side to side. So if f is continuous on an interval from a to b, to find the closed intervals on which f is increasing or decreasing, you follow the following steps. You find the critical points. Remember, that's where f prime either equals 0 or does not exist. You want to find the critical points of f and then use those numbers to determine some test intervals. Then you use those intervals to determine the sign of f prime at one value inside the interval. And then you use the signs of the derivative to determine whether the function is increasing or decreasing. So let's just hop right into it. Find the intervals on which this cubic function is increasing and or decreasing. So step one is find the critical value. So find where f prime equals 0 or does not exist. Well, f prime using the power rule is 3x squared minus 12. That's never undefined, so I'm not going to worry about does not exist. I'm going to set it equal to 0 to find my critical values. So if I set that equal to 0, I pull out a 3x squared minus 4 equals 0. So x equals plus or minus 2. 
Now I'm going to use these to find intervals. My intervals are defined by using the domain of the function and making pauses at the critical value. So the domain of this function is negative infinity to infinity. So I'm going to go from negative infinity to negative 2, closed because we're dealing with increase, decrease, negative 2 to 2, and then 2 to infinity. So negative infinity to infinity are the basic domain of the function, and I pause at each critical point in between. So what this means is from negative infinity to negative 2, f prime has the same sign the whole time. So let's find f prime of negative 3. So if I look at f prime here and I want f prime of negative 3, I'm going to have 9 minus 4, which is 5. 3 times 5 is positive. So f prime is greater than 0 on this interval. Therefore, f is increasing on that interval. Then I'm going to look from negative 2 to 2. So a very useful number in there would be 0. f prime of 0 would be negative 12. So f prime of 0 is less than 0, which means f is decreasing on this interval. And then from 2 to infinity, f of 3, I'm sorry, f prime of 3, is going to be the same as f prime of negative 3. So it's going to be positive, and f is increasing. So there's my intervals. f increases from negative infinity to negative 2, and from 2 to infinity, and f decreases from negative 2 to 2. If I look down here and I want to find the intervals on this guy, same process. Step 1, take your derivative. So g prime is going to be 2 thirds x squared minus 9 to the negative 1 third times 2x, which if I rewrote it is going to be 4x over 3 times the cube root of x squared minus 9. Now I want to know when this equals 0 and when it does not exist. Well, let's see, it doesn't exist when the bottom equals 0, so it does not exist at x equals plus or minus 3. And it equals 0 when the top equals 0, which is just going to be at x equals 0. Right? 4x equals 0 when x equals 0. The bottom equals 0 when x equals plus or minus 3. So let's talk about the domain. This is a cube root function, and cube roots can be taken of really anything. So my original domain is negative infinity and infinity, but now I need to pause at 0, 3, and negative 3. So negative 3 here. Negative 3 to 0 would be my next interval. 0 to 3 would be my next interval. And 3 to infinity would be my final interval. All right? So I wonder if I can move this. Look at that. I can move it over. So then, da, 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 what am I doing next? I have my intervals. They're all broken up. Now I need to do test points. So I'm going to test. This is g. So g prime of negative 4. I'm going to test g prime of negative 2. I'm going to test g prime of 2, and I'm going to test g prime of 4. So g prime of negative 4. Okay, we are only interested in positive versus negative. So when I come over here and plug this into my derivative, I'm only going to deal with pluses and minuses. So the top is negative. 16 minus 9 is positive. A negative divided by a positive is a negative. Therefore, g is decreasing. See how I did that? I don't care what the function value is. I care whether it's positive or negative. All right, g prime of negative 2. Negative 4 minus 9 is negative. A negative divided by a negative is a positive. So that's greater than 0. g is increasing. 0 to 3, let's try g of 2. Positive, negative, therefore negative. g is decreasing. g prime of 4, positive, positive greater than 0, g is increasing. Okay, so long story short, what we did on this page so far is we figured out the critical values, we broke up into intervals, and then we tested an interior point from the interval in the derivative to find the sign of the derivative, and the sign of the derivative tells me if g is increasing or decreasing. Okay, all right, we did a lot. Let's go to the next page. Now, Local extreme values are based on what we just did. So local extreme values are these guys right here. They're the high points and the low points on the end, um, I'm sorry, on the interior of the interval. Now, the AP exam 
only considers interior points as local extrema. So technically for our purposes, even though your book is going to call this a local min, this is not a local min to us. Neither is this a local min because it's an endpoint. We just exclude endpoints from any conversation dealing with local extrema. We only care about local extrema where there are hills, valleys, cusps, or peaks and pointy curves and stuff like that. So all these hills and valleys are local extreme values. Now some of them are also absolute values. So this is the absolute max as well as a local max, and that can happen too. So definition-wise, a local max is a local max if it's the highest point, if f of x is less than f of c, if it's the highest point for all points around c. But really, this is just a really mathy definition for saying a local max is a local max because it's the highest point of all the points nearby. I don't look way over here. I just look close to it. Okay. Um, and again, the AP exam does not consider endpoints as local extrema, so we aren't going to consider those as local extrema, although your book does. So when you go to check answers in the back of the book, ignore any that reference endpoints as local extrema. Okay. Um, to avoid that confusion, the AP usually only asks for local extrema on an open interval. So they'd say find the local extrema on the interval from A to B, which means A and B are not included in your answer set. Okay. Um, but I've been yammering around for a while now. Let's figure out how to identify local extrema. Well, I would really want to find local extrema, and local extrema occur at hills, valleys, peaks, and cusps, so those are all critical points. Hills, valleys, peaks, and cusps, those are all points where f prime either equals zero or does not exist. So we're going to calculate the critical points and create intervals. Well, I did that already. Classify each interval as increasing or decreasing. I did that already. Then we're going to use what's called the first derivative test to determine the x-coordinates of the extrema. Before I do this, I'm going to have you flip back to the other page. And we're going to look down here. And we're going to sketch a graph. So if I have this, if I know this stuff about that cubic, I know the cubic increases, and then it decreases, and then it increases. So if I were to connect these, let's see. Hang on, i got to ungroup them. Um, if I were to connect these, it increases, no, stop, it increases, and then it decreases, and then it increases. Look at that. There's a local max, there's a local min. When it switches from increasing to decreasing, if F existed at that endpoint, then it has a local extreme value. Okay, and that's just what the first derivative test says. It says that if x equals c is a critical point of f, and f of c exists, there has to be a point there for it to be a local extrema, then if f changes, I'm sorry, if f prime changes sign from positive to negative, then you have a local max, because that meant f was increasing, and then f is decreasing. Increase to decrease, local max. Negative to positive means you were decreasing, then increasing, local min. And if f prime does not change sign at c, then it doesn't have a relative extremum. It has what I like to call a hiccup. So you got your local max, you got your local min. Then if you increase, pause, and increase some more, that's neither. It's a critical value. It's a horizontal tangent, but it is not a local extreme value. Um, and then last but not least, you want x and y coordinates of local extrema because we're interested in where they are and what they are. Uh, so that's what we really need to look at. So I want you to take a second here, and I want you to look at this function, and I want you to find the critical values, and then we'll come back, and it will magically appear. I want you to try to follow all those steps. Nothing new really happened. I want you to try this before you watch me. And if you want, when you come back, you can watch me, and watch me at like one and a half or double time speed to see how it goes. Okie doke. See you in a minute. All right, so this one was kind of tricky. So what we had to do here is we had to first figure out, well, what's the domain of x minus 4 minus x squared? Well, the domain would be to keep this inside positive, and the only way that's going to happen, or 0, and the only way that's going to happen is to stay with a negative 2 and 2. So then from there, what I did is I went through and I took the derivative. So my derivative is a product rule. The first 
times the derivative of the second, which includes a chain rule, bring down the power, reduce it by one, times the derivative of the inside. So the first times the derivative of the second, plus the second times the derivative of the first, which is technically one. So then I thought, okay, well, I have to solve this. And if I have to solve an equation, I'm going to rewrite it in a form that I'm more comfortable with when it comes to solving. So I rewrote this as negative x squared over the square root of 4 minus x squared. And I left that in radical form. And I said, I need to know when that equals 0 or does not exist. Well, it won't exist when this bottom equals 0, which is at plus or minus 2. And it equals 0 when this piece is equal to that piece. So that's what I have down here. I multiply by the radical. And then what did I do? Then the radical disappeared, and I solved for x and got plus or minus root 2. So I have a domain from negative 2 to 2 with pauses at plus or minus root 2. So my intervals are from negative root 2 to negative 2, I'm sorry, negative 2 to negative root 2, negative root 2 to root 2, and root 2 to 2. That's very hard to say. So then I decided to evaluate f prime at negative 1.9. 1.9 and 0. And when I evaluated f prime of negative 1.9, I did it without the calculator by thinking of it this way. This is a number really close to negative 2. So this is going to be really close to negative 4. And this is going to be really close to 4 minus 4, which is 0. So I have negative 4 divided by a tiny number, which makes this a negative huge number, plus something close to 0. So negative infinity basically plus zero is going to be negative and then at zero this is zero and that's four so it's greater than zero and at 1.9 I have the same thing happen that happened at negative 1.9 so f prime is negative positive negative therefore f is decreasing increasing decreasing so decrease to increase I have a min at negative root 2 increase to decrease I have a max at positive root 2, and then I just said negative root 2, plug it into the original, and got negative 2. And then at positive root 2, plug it into the original, and I get 2 back. Now I'm going to stop there, we're going to do more together as a class. Um, there also might be a follow-up video in case you miss class. Um, but basically, long story short, you just need to know that you need to find intervals of increase and decrease, and then using those intervals determine if it goes up, then down, and therefore has a max. All right, I will talk with you all again soon. Have a great day.